Shabbat Shalom. Today's parasha is Re'eh, which means to see. I'm going to talk about a couple of different themes through this parasha. One that comes out to me is intensifying the fear of God in your life. And I know that some people, you know, you don't want to have fear of God, right? You want to be able to run boldly to his throne. But this message is, this message, this parasha is, uh, is an interesting one. It takes us all the way even back to Gan Eden. All of it does really. We all go back to Gan Eden. Specifically for this parasha, it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of knowledge and good and evil is the, it, 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 it epitomizes the essence of your free will. Within the concept of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you have this essence of free will that God gave you to choose. To choose from the good or to choose from the evil. The blessing or the curse. You have an option in your life. Yeshua says to his disciples, to, his, to, to the Pharisees, to the Jewish people of the day, how often I've desired to gather you, like a hen gathers her chicks, and bring you in. Yeshua is telling the people of Israel, I want to be Mashiach ben David. But as a result of your inability to come into the blessing, to come into the good, to choose the good versus the evil, I have to be Mashiach ben Yosef. I have to be the soul of this Mashiach bin David, the, 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 the idea that is outside of the scope of what the Jewish people adopted. The Jewish people adopted the idea that there will be this messianic kingdom in this reign. I think that Yeshua could have and would have established his kingdom 2,000 years ago as bin David if his people were ready. I think he could have and would have established his kingdom if the people were ready. But remember, they rejected, they rejected him. And not everyone rejected him, obviously, because we have the faith that we have today from 2,000 years ago. Not everyone rejected him. But there, were, there was rejection, okay, as a whole. And I think that Yeshua's intent... What Yeshua was intending for his people was that they find unity within each other. And let me, let me share a thought I had about this concept of unity, even within the, the larger Christian environment. Okay. There's not a Christian church in the world that's not anticipating the coming of Messiah, the coming of Yeshua, whether it be by, via rapture or whether it be whatever it be, you know, name it. They anticipate Jesus is coming again. They tell you, Jesus is coming. He's coming. He comes at your death or he comes uh, prior to your death and, and restores you, right, and gives you a new body and all those things, okay? Whatever it may be from the Christian theological perspective, they all believe that Jesus is coming, but... What kind of people, even within Christianity, is Jesus coming to get? 
There's no unity. Even in Christianity. Even within the Christian environment, there's no unity. We're no different than we were 2,000 years ago. There's no unity in Messiah. You know, we sing this message, the song, Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah. You know, I forget how it goes, but that we sing that song. There's no unity in Mashiach. Not now. There's no unity in Messianic Judaism, I can tell you that. There's no unity in the church. Everybody has their idea of what is right, what is the right way to live. Okay, everybody does. And so as a result, they sit back and they stare, and they, you know, from the, from the crowds, and they make, they, they lob arguments against each other. They debate. You go online, they set up debates between each other. Theological debates about who God is, about what he's doing, his intent, what the days will be. All along, nobody's really being, nobody's really moving the kingdom of God closer. No one's really bringing the kingdom of God closer to earth. We're actually, through our disunity, pushing the kingdom of God further out. We're not ready. We're not ready for him to return. And there's an idea that the Mashiach comes, he'll create the unity. What did Yeshua say? I said it a couple weeks ago to, his, to, his, to the Jewish people. When he said, for I have always wanted to gather you. First, so long now. But you will not see me again. You will not see me again. Until you say, Baruch haba Hashem Hashem. It means that you have to call out to me, or you will not see me. Now, Christian theology would say, well, I disagree with that. I think that, you know, God will come when he's ready. God will be ready when we're ready. It's like sending your son to a people that are going to reject you. Okay, and I think I said this a few weeks ago. Why would the father choose to send his son again to a world that would crucify him again? Reject who he is. The Christian world doesn't know who Yeshua is. I can promise you. When he comes, they'll probably, many will be upset with who he is. Because they've devised a concept of who he is. And when, when he shows up, the Christian world's going to say, well, you're not who we thought. You, you're not what we, what we put together in our, in our studies, in, 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 our, in our theologic, in our, in our dogma. You see, that's exactly what happened to the Jews of the first century. They looked at Yeshua and said, well, well you're not what we thought. You're riding lowly on a donkey. We're waving palms. All along, the Mashiach ben Yosef is to, to wage war against the enemy of sin. You know, that's the, that's the purpose of ben Yosef in the rabbinic writings. He is a Messiah of war, ben Yosef is. In the rabbinic writings, it says it. And what did Yeshua say? I came to bring a sword. <laughs> he came as a king to wage war. Not simply a, 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 a king that was just supposed to get beaten and scourged. He waged war while he was being beaten. That was part of the war. He was at war. He was warring, doing that. That was war. He was being a courageous, divine Mashiach through that war that he was going through. And so, we paint pictures of who Yeshua will be and who he is. And in our pictures that we paint, we have different ideas of 
what we should be doing in our life. And so it creates disunity. There's no unity. There's no unity in Christianity. All the Christians in the world could come together in one place and there would be a war. There's no unity. Ignoring the fact that I believe one thing or you believe another, and I can do that. I have that unique ability where I don't care if you agree with me on things. I'm okay with you disagreeing. It's not a big deal to me. It means it doesn't mean anything. The only thing that matters to me is that we get the, the most important things right, and that is Yeshua Hu HaMashiach. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. All the other stuff we can get around, it's fine. We can debate it. It doesn't matter. I don't have to be right about certain things. And I think that, you know, from the perspective of where Yeshua is at, John 15, he says, I am the vine, and my father is the vine dresser. And all the fruit, and all the, all the branches which do not bear fruit, my Father will break off. And all the branches that bear fruit, my Father will prune. And in that pruning, they will bear more fruit. And so there's a process in the faith where you have to figure out how to abide in him. He says in John 15, love your neighbor in John 15. Love them. And love isn't doing love love isn't love isn't doing what someone wants you to do. Love isn't giving them what they want. Okay, just let me say that. That's important to know. Everybody thinks that if you, don't, if you don't give someone what they want or treat them the way they want to be treated, that you're not loving them. Maybe the way they want to be treated isn't going to show love. Maybe you're just enabling them to continue in a, in a way that's wrong. So don't enable them. It's love not to enable your brother or your sister when they want to do things that you think are contrary to the Word of God. And I think that what you do contrary to the Word of God is going to be clear to most people. They're not going to reconcile with it if you are in the Spirit. If you're walking in the Spirit, you won't reconcile with the things in the world that people are trying to do. I don't feel that doesn't feel right. It feels wrong to me. I don't know if it's wrong. I'm not sure what God's doing. But it feels wrong. And so you have to figure out how to act within that, within that circumstance. But John 15, and I just, I love it. I read it this week. It was so good to me. So I'm going to read some of it. Verse 3 is so impactful. that if you just read verse 3 and you take it for yourself, it should change your life. It's, trans it's a transformative scripture. It's very simple. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Already you are clean. You are clean. In your, in your wickedness, in your failure, in your inability to overcome, in, in, in your weakness, no matter what it is, you are clean because of what I've spoken to you. He's telling you that you are clean. If you abide in me, he says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abide in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. You will not bear fruit unless you are in Yeshua, period. Yeshua is the center. You will not bear fruit. 
It's not going to come, no matter what you think, no matter what you do. You can say, well, Yeshua is kind of out there watching over me. No, 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 no. You are in him. In him is different. In unity with him, walking with him, in his presence, in his, in his ways, in his understanding. He says, I'm the way, so walk in his way. He says, I'm the truth, so walk in his truth. He says, I am the life, so be in his life, not your own. Your desires die. Literally, your desires die. Literally, your wants die. Literally, who you are dies. You must die to yourself. Literally, you have to die and be reborn. What you want is not important anymore. What you need is Him. I am the vine, you're the branches. Who abides in me and I in him, he is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. This intensify your fear of God in your life. Every decision you're making, every, every path you're taking, every walk that you step, if it's not in Him, you're at risk of being broken off, thrown into a brush pile, and burned. Yeshua says it. These are red letters. This isn't me just coming up. This is not a theological musing. This isn't me digging into it and saying, well, what does he mean by that? Let's just take a look at that scripture and really dig in and under, try to understand it. No, no, no. It is what it is by, if you're not in me. The real question is, what does it mean to be in me? It means to be outside of you. You cannot lead you. Well, I had an idea. I had a thought. I'm going to go do it. Well, okay. Do you know if it's God? Well, I'm going to take my steps forward. We hear this all the time. I'm going to take the steps forward and do it. I'm just going to step out in faith. I'm going to step out in faith and I'm going to go do it. And I'm going to believe. And then it doesn't turn out the way you want it to. Well, people say, well, that's, what, that's how you do it. That's how, that's how we've been taught in the church. Yeah, I know. That's how you've been taught in the church. But sha'ar bitachon, the gates of trust. Okay, when we come to the gates of trust, we literally wait to hear. We wait to hear, to move. And then confirmation will come. That's facts. I believe it. I mean, it'll come. You trust and you wait. And those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength in a way that their strength has never been renewed because you're standing upon His promises. You're abiding in Him. He says, abide in me, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Why? Because you're in Yeshua. You're in his will. It's not saying, you know what, Lord, I want to go do this. I've always had a desire to do this in my life. I've always wanted to do that. So can I go do, can you please open the door that I can go do that? No, you know. There's things, okay, don't get me wrong, you want to enjoy your life. There's things in life that you want to do that you really want, you know, and, and to have. And, and I think God would allow you to be, you know, those permissive things to happen. I'm talking about the major parts of your life, okay? This is what I'm talking about. But when you ask in the name of Yeshua from the Father for anything, if, if it's already in the will of Yeshua, you're already walking in His will, you're abiding in Him, therefore you receive that which you ask. Because you're abiding in Him. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in me. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. 
Think about this scripture, this week's parasha. The blessing and the curse. There's a curse if you're disobedient to the commands, right? And there's a blessing if you're obedient. He says, if you abide in Yeshua's love, you keep his commandments. What does it mean to keep his commandments? Well, we try our best as a people. We try our best to keep Shabbat. We try our best to, to do the things of the scripture. We do, we, go out of, we, we do interrupt our lives from the normal way, like everyone else does. You know, the world follows a certain rudiment, which is basically whatever they will, okay? Which is the satanic, you know, way, what thou wilt do they do whatever they wilt okay whatever, wherever they want to go and we we sacrifice that stuff for our faith and for our belief because we believe that that God is sovereign and that his commands are important and so we look back to his commands and we say okay Lord how do we do this then I was telling some people the other day like I don't know if this is the right way to keep Shabbat the way we do it, but I, what I can tell you is we honor the Shabbat by gathering together. Yeah, we say some liturgy. We, we say some things. The most beautiful thing is, is we gather together as community and we break bread together. And it's not just a little, it's not just coming in, saying hi and leaving. We break bread. We develop relationships to do what? Ve'ahavta l'reacha kamoka. To learn to love your neighbor, to learn about them, their situations. All week long we see there's prayer chains that go on for people in this, in this community. All week long, which shows that the, the, the neighbor is being loved. We're loving each other. We care about the harm. We care about the sickness. We care about the disease. We care about the nakedness, the unclothed. We care about the imprisoned. We care about the things that we're supposed to care about. We do our best. We do what we're supposed to do in our hearts. And we try, we try to do all the things that God requires of us in his commandments, but this is what's interesting. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. You know, you, you have joy in life when you're at peace. You have joy in life when you're at peace. And the only way you really truly come to peace is when you're at, when you're at peace with your fellow. Everything could be in total disarray around your life. But if you have an infrastructure of love, you don't lose joy. When you have people that care for you, that uphold you, that hold your arms up when you're in, when you're in a weak state, that, that, that stand in the gap for you when you're in a weak state, that stay there, you can be completely depressed and down and you can still have joy inside because you know you have fellowship. The problem with our communities within Christianity and Judaism and Messianic Judaism is that most of that love is fake. It's to your face. And then behind your back, there's a lot of that. It's serpentine, serpentine. It's, it's slithering tongues that go on. This is facts. This is, this is me just calling out what it is, guys. I mean, you know that, I know that, but that's called disunity. You think Yeshua is coming back for that people? No, no, no. We have to learn truly how to love each other to create unity and peace. It's different. And the reason there's talk, let me say, because everybody has their own idea of what should be and the way the circumstances should be in life. So they create ideas, and if somebody 
disagrees, then it's, did you hear that so-and-so said, or did you hear that so-and-so said, or did you hear this, or did you hear that? I just read this week about, you know, Etan Barr, who, who was fired from One for Israel, and he's divorced from his wife now. Etan Barr is a great, great guy. He wrote some great books. We, we read the books. They're great. He was fired from One for Israel. One for Israel is a big ministry in Israel, big messianic ministry. He was fired. He got divorced. And now he's, now he's completely, you know, he used to derail the rabbinics, the rabbis. He used to go after the rabbis in his writings. But now he's completely destroying Christianity because, because they're upset that he got divorced and they fired him because of his divorce. And so now he's just destroying Christianity in their belief and the way they think because you know, um, he, he, he thinks that, that they're wrong. They're, they're going to create more harm than good. The damage that gets created by people like that to the larger body is ridiculous. <laughs> like Etan, you got divorced. You had a bad way with your marriage. Embrace it. They fired you because you had some things that embrace it and move on into what God has called you to. Why create the illusion of failure in the larger church? Why? Why create more disunity? Why play a part in that? He, he, he doesn't, he, he's doing it. It's weird. It's weird. That to me is wrong. That to me is not biblical. I believe in just keeping your mouth shut. When you have, some, when you have a disagreement with somebody or something, keep your mouth shut. Let God work it out. Don't go after it. We all need to learn that, by the way. Everybody needs to keep their mouths shut among each other and, and start giving things to God like that's a truth so here we have Yeshua not wanting to come back not ready to gather his exiles in so he's been Yosef not ready I've wanted to so long but I can't because you're not ready neither is the church Unity has to come together. We are not in unity. And that's partially because of our free will. And our free will is the ability to choose between what is good and what is evil. The ability to choose to, to walk and abide in Yeshua's love or not to abide in Yeshua's love. John 15, 12, it says, This is my commandment, that you love one another. Ve'ahavta le'riacha kamoka. As I have loved you, this is very important. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. That someone lay down his life for his friends. Then he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Okay, what does that mean? That means that if you're, if in order to do what he commands us, we have to lay down, we have to lay down our lives. Like, you should read that differently. Like, he's not saying go die for your friend. Don't, he's not saying go take a bullet for me. He's not saying go get your head lopped off for me. He's saying follow my commands, then you can say you're my friends. Do what I say, and you can say that you're my friend. Love me through doing what I say. Which means laying down your own will. And following his will. Following his will. These are the red letters, okay? This is not me just talking about because I wear a kippah and I'm, I call myself a Jew. I, you know, I'm just saying you have to keep the commands, okay? The church would say that, right? I have a kippah on and I'm, I'm telling you to keep the commands. And I could say that in our congregation. It's our temple. I wouldn't go to a church and say, you have to follow the commands because that's not, that's not the approach to take. But all of you are messianic. Minus some of our guests, maybe. So yes, I'm going to stay firm on the fact that we keep God's commands. Why? Because Yeshua said to do it. But the greatest one he said, here, right here in John. 
The greatest one is love. The greatest one is love. And love can look very different to many different people. You can actually be loving someone and they think that you hate them. You can be loving someone and they think that you hate them. And, you know, look at your children. How many of you have children that are, that are tough? You don't love me. You hate me. Because why? You're not doing what they want. You're not being who they want you to be. You're not succumbing to what you don't think is God. And that's okay. So just be silent in it. I don't agree with it, so I'll be silent in it. Rather than causing more drama and more, more issues. Intensifying the fear of God in our lives because we could potentially become branches that are not bearing fruit and then broken off and thrown into a brush pile and burned as per the red letters of Yeshua. That kind of shakes up a little bit of theology as well. The church would say, no, once you're saved, you're saved. He literally said there's branches that come from him. That's salvation. <laughs> if you come from him, you're saved. You're part of him. You're part of his tree. And he's saying that branches can be broken off because they what? Become dead. That branch becomes dead and they're broken off. They br he breaks off the dead. That's a scary feeling. It doesn't bear fruit. And maybe it does bear fruit. It's just its own fruit. It's not the fruit of God. And so he'll break that off. That's a scary thing. Intensify the fear of God in your life. So that you can abide in him. And in abiding in him, you can learn to love, love the way he commands us to love. Learning the, the, the unity that's required between brothers and sisters is so important between communities, between Jews and Christians. We are brothers and sisters. Christianity and Judaism must come together. It's a fact. You can't, you can't, save the one, you can't save the one without the other. They both have to find unity. And there's disunity even among Christians and, and Messianic Jews. Literally, I mean, I was, you know, in a conversation a couple weeks ago with a Christian and talking about their pastor, and their pastor would, uh, would consider me unsaved. Which I think is, okay, I, I get it. I mean, I, I, I've experienced that millions of times in my life from Christianity, but I'm unsaved. How? Well, because you believe in following the law and you believe in this and you're not in, you're not, you're not, you know, you're not doing what the church requires. Well, what's the church require? And then there's a list of dogmatic things that are required that are not found in the scripture itself. That's like casting pearls before swine. I turn around and move on. I don't even bother with that conversation. There's no point. But let's look here at this week's parsha. The journey of the children of Israel from Egypt to the wilderness is not just a historical event that we look back and say, I'm going to read about it. It's not just a historical event like it's in a history book. It's a spiritual blueprint for all of humanity. Rescued from Pharaoh's grip, Israel began to embark on a path that was designed by God to guide not only themselves, but all nations throughout time. All nations throughout time. Every nation. Call it Ephraim and Judah. Call it Esav and, and Yaakov. Call it whatever you will. It's every nation. Everyone is to follow a blueprint that God lays out for us in the scriptures. We're the heirs of this journey, you and I. 
through the physical experiences of our spiritual and physical ancestors, we gain insight as that acts as the compass that directs us to uphold the covenant that our God wants. God's covenant. You guys know the Pirates of the Caribbean movie, right? Why do people want Jack Sparrow's compass? Do you know why? It points you into the direction of what you want. His compass points you into the direction of what you want. So if you have a thought in your mind, okay, I want, to, I want my wife. Look at the compass. There she is. The Torah points us into the direction of what God wants. This is our compass, not our own. So we abide in Yeshua that leads us into what God wants, not to what we, we, what we want, not for our own lusts, not to fulfill our own lusts, but God's will. The Baal Shem Tov remarked that God gives physical form to the spiritual. And he said the Jew makes spiritual the physical. So we make, we make spiritual all the things that happen and occur to us in the physical. We make them very spiritual to understand them at a deeper, higher level. To, to rise to a higher level with, of understanding with God. We take these physical things that are occurring are not simply things that are happening to us. They're not simply happenstance. However, what they are are guiding lights and principles, no matter if it's good or no matter if it's bad. The hardship and the chaos, including the joy and the peace, are all a part of this experience we have that are leading us to a spiritual end, which is great for all of us. This is what we believe. This is our belief. This should be your belief. This is your hope. At the end of the day, I'm just going to interject right here real quick. Our hope is Yeshua. Our end is Him. That's it. Nothing else. We have to be working toward that. His kingdom coming. That's been the theme from the beginning of the year with me. Is the coming kingdom. It's coming. And we have to keep that as the theme. For until he comes, and then, and then you go out and bear fruit by having people, by teaching them about the kingdom coming. Stop asking people, where are you going to go when you die? And start telling them, there's a great and mighty kingdom that's coming. Do you know about it? Let's not bring people to faith by fear, but bring people to faith by, by anticipation, by excitement. By joy. Who wants to come to faith by fear? I think it's the wrong approach. It's not the right approach. Come to faith by knowing there's a king coming. And you want to get to know him before he shows. So that when he arrives, you're there with him. And you're standing there with your palms waving. That's the joy of the faith. You don't come to faith by fear. I don't believe in that. I don't believe that's true faith. Well, I'm afraid to go to hell. I don't want to burn in hell. Well, that's, that, you know what that tells me? That tells me that you sin a lot. Someone that says, oh, I don't want to go to hell, tells me that they spend a lot of time in their physical body, in the flesh, and they're scared of hell because of the things they're doing in the flesh. When you live in the spirit, I have no fear of hell. I have no fear of hell. For what? I'm in the spirit. The only thing I have is anticipation of the glory of God coming to the earth. Baruch Hashem. Everyone should be saying that. So lead people into that understanding. Guide people into that knowledge and truth. God in his infinite wisdom has taken what is eternal and spiritual. He wrapped it up in the physical through manifest, manifested in us. The Torah from Har Sinai, that was eternal and spiritual, and he put it on stone tablets. 
He made it physical. He made the laws that he had for his people physical by applying them on stone tablets. He, he took and, and, and made the concept of Ben Yosef and Ben David, the soul of Mashiach and the conquering Mashiach, and he, and he took them and he put them into a man that we call Yeshua. He took the spiritual idea of salvation of Yeshua and put it into a man and called him, in fact, Yeshua, salvation. Emmanuel, on the earth, by inhabiting his mother with the Holy Spirit and birthing him from her womb. He took the spiritual and made it physical. Our sacred duty is to live in such a way that the physical becomes an expression of the spiritual, living from the inside out, allowing the true nature of humanity to flourish on this earth. You have to take that which is spiritual and manifest it in the physical for people around you. And I'm not talking about just being a good person. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about truly ministering the God, the God of Israel. Have you ever been with people that you know that are believers and that may be messianic and you go out and you meet people? Like, for instance, I always tell people when I first meet them that we're messianic. Somehow I always find a way, ask my wife, to talk about our temple. It's part of me. It's in me. But I'll be out with people and they, the moment I bring it up, they, 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 they dip. Well, where, where'd they go? Well, that person that you're talking to, I already know, and they don't know that I go to your congregation, and I'm not interested in them. They know me as someone else. They know me as somebody else, so I don't want them to know me as that right now. Wickedness. Choosing between good and evil. Free will to make a decision. To stand in the good or walk in the evil. Embarrassed to tell the world of the church. People that have come in here embarrassed from the church. You know, I don't want my church to know I come here. I mean, we were told by many people that before. People that come in from the church. I don't, we know their friends or family. Don't tell anyone we're coming here because they don't know I'm here. Why? Because somehow we have ideas that are separate, which create disunity, which creates the lack of love. You know that I have the ability inside of me to, when someone says, don't tell, don't tell anyone, I have the ability inside of me to get really angry about that. Like I, I, can, I can remember like the old mic that would come out. Like, Baruch Hashem, I'm in transformation mode, right? But, but the old mic would come out and be like, what? It immediately creates disunity. And then I, I allow that disunity. I allow it. I can allow it. And I want to go head to head with it. Okay, let's have this fight. Let me talk about your congregation. Let me talk about your pastor. Let me do this. That's what ends up happening. That's not love. That's war. Spiritual warfare that Satan brings in to distract us from what we're supposed to be doing. And that's bringing the kingdom of God. I'm not going to be distracted anymore. We have a mission. You have a mission. We can't be distracted. And if you're the distraction, if you're the subtraction from the community, then subtract yourself out. Be a multiplication in the community. Be an addition in the community. And that addition and multiplication is multiplying the kingdom that's coming. Multiplying that Yeshua is king. Multiplying that he is wearing a royal robe. That the keter, the crown, the crown sits upon his head. And Baruch Hashem, he's coming. And I don't care that your congregation, Messianic congregation does that. Or that your Messianic congregation does that. We have to be in unity. Rabbi so-and-so and Rabbi so-and-so. We have communities of people that believe in this, and we've got to guide them in the truth. So how are we doing it? Guide them in Yeshua. 
Your politics have to die. The existence of living on the inside out, which is different from wearing the outside in, because guess what? The old, the old, uh, the old Mike lived on the outside. You hit me, and the outside responds. How do you get hit? You should just take in, take it in, let it absorb in through your flesh, into your spirit, and watch your spirit dissipate all of that. Take it in. The scripture, God fights my battles, all those things. Those are all important. Live on the inside out. It's a delicate balance as our free will can lead us toward good or evil. It's determined by our spiritual desires. So whatever our spirit thinks, whatever our mind thinks up, whatever we desire on the inside, we can think up. That's true. That's true. That, those things that you hear people saying in the real world, if you just believe in it, and if you focus, and if you, you know, you know those, things that te- those, those messages that people give outside in the fleshly world where they say you can manifest things in your life, if you just, what do, you, what do they call it? You've got you to gotta focus. What is it like the focused stuff that they do? They, they guide you in, on, on paths to where you want to be. They say, imagine your end and then, then walk yourself, meditate through to get there. You know, that stuff actually is true. You know why? The more you think about something, the more you act out in your life to go get it. You know, Yeshua said the same thing. If you tell this mountain here to be thou removed, it will if you have faith. You understand that's the same concept. I have faith to believe that I'm going to get here and overcome this trial and overcome this problem. I have faith to believe it. Even if I have the faith of a mustard seed, I'm going to move this mountain. That's the same idea. It's just the physical world doesn't put Yeshua to it. It's the same concept. Conceptually, it's, it's right. So that's why you know, there's confusion. Do what thou wilt versus do what God wilt. The difference is the mountain in front of us, when I have the mustard seed of faith inside of me, I'm saying to God, I'm on path. I'm on the path you placed me, Lord. And in front of me, there's this great and mighty mountain in front of the path that you've placed me. I have faith to believe that you, God, will move the mountain which is in front of me because I'm walking on the path that you placed for me. Versus the world that says, do what thy wilt. I'm on this path that I want. There's a mountain in front of me. I have to remove that mountain. And I believe I will remove that mountain through my courage, dedication, and perseverance. And blah, 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 blah. There's a difference. That mountain that's in front of you in your flesh and life is not getting moved unless God needs it moved to send you over the cliff in the swine. Or if he needs it moved to send you on a path that leads you to him. Either way a blessing or a curse. Where is he leading us? Deuteronomy 11 teaches that blessings and curses are the direct result of our commitment to God's commandments. The chapter begins with emphasizing that Moshe, his words were not of his own making, but divinely ordained. They were rooted in the experiences of the Israelites who witnessed God's mighty works firsthand. Moshe reminds them that their ancestors saw God's power in Egypt in the parting of the sea and throughout their journey in the wilderness. They physically saw it with their own eyes. They were there. And so we have a very basic outline here in Deuteronomy chapter 11 to follow in order to realize God's blessings. Let's start reading verse 1. Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and his statutes, and his judgments, and his commandments, always. Sounds like what Yeshua said about himself. Moshe is not Yeshua, so he's talking about Yeshua. Yeshua talks in the first person. He says, keep my commandments. Moshe says, keep God's commandments. Right? 
And know this day, for I speak not with your children which have not known and which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his outstretched arm, and his miracles, and his acts, which he did in the midst of Egypt unto Pharaoh the king of Egypt, and unto all this land, and what he did unto the army of Egypt, unto their horses, unto their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea to overflow them as they pursued after you, how the Lord hath destroyed them unto his day. He's telling them, reminding them, Look at everything you said. I, look at everything you saw. Re'e. Look at everything you see. With your eyes. Same thing in your life. Look at your life. Look at your past. Look at your present. And see where God is moving. What he's done for you. It's the same thing for us. Keep steadfast because God is with us. Emmanuel. And here he's telling them. He's reminding them. And what he did unto you in the wilderness until you came into this place. And what he did unto Dathan and, and, and Ivaram and the sons of Eliav, the son of Reuben. How the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their households and their tents and all the substance that was in their possession in the midst of Israel. The earth literally swallowed them up. God was angry. They chose the curse. And they saw it with their eyes. Yeshua says, don't be a branch that doesn't bear fruit that's come off of my vine, lest you get plucked off and thrown into a, into a brush pile and burned. These men, were done, it was done to them right before their eyes. God plucked them off of the limb. The vine dresser, the father, plucked them right off of the vine and threw them into the pit, the abyss, right in front of the eyes of Israel, which should tell you, I need to keep my fruit right. That should check your mind all the time. You should always be checking your mind. Did I say the right thing? Did I think that thing? My voice? Did I, you know, am I, am I doing this or that? Am I being, am I gossiping? Am I doing this? You know, it should check you. I have to, the father is the vine dresser. The father is the vine dresser. Remember that. Your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord which he did. Therefore shall ye keep all the commandments which I command you this day. You've seen the great acts. Therefore you keep them. That ye may be strong and go in and possess the land whether you go. And that ye may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swear unto your father to give them. And to their seed, that land, the land flowing with milk and honey. For the land whither thou goest in to possess it, it is as the land of Egypt from whence ye came out. He says, he says, listen, you've been in the desert, but the land I'm sending you to is just like Egypt. It's beautiful and flowing with milk and honey, and it's, and it's got basar and meat and all the things that you need to survive, and the plants and the trees and the figs and the, all the stuff, it's all there, just like Egypt. You want to go back to Egypt, that's the evil. That's the, that's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You want to go back to the, to the evil and eat from that fruit, but I'm giving you a new fruit, a fruit that is good. For every good in life, there is a bad. That's what the idea of tree of knowledge of good and evil is. There's an opposite to every good. For everything you do good, you negate with something you've done bad. True. And so these guys are trying to, God's trying to send them to the good. Take them out of the hands of the bad. But the land, whither ye go to possess it, in the land of the hills of valleys, drinketh water, the rain of heaven, and the land which the Lord God cares for you. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. God is watching over and caring for the land that his name is upon. Here we see Moshe point that, point that, that this direct encounter with the divine leaves no room for doubt. There's no doubt that God is moving in us and by us and through us. There's no doubt that the commands are not just human directives, but God's eternal words. These aren't just human directives. This wasn't Moshe writing these things down in a book, which is what people say. Well, Moshe wrote the, the Torah, and, you know, in there he put what he thought, and, and we don't need to follow that anymore. But, God, but Yeshua was clear. 
Don't ever get confused. We literally have God himself speaking to us through Yeshua. Literally, God himself through Yeshua is speaking to us. If you get confused about something in the scriptures, theologically, with, with Rav Shaul or with, with, your, with your rabbis or with your church or with whoever, with your pastors, your leaders, you get confused, read Yeshua. It should align. And so the moment someone tells you that we don't have to keep the words of Moses... And you go back and you read where Yeshua says to keep the words of Moses. Then you see. It's safer to follow that. Chapter 13, 1 through 4 says, If there rise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let's go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or the dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proved you, to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, fear him, and keep his commandments, obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. He's literally telling you that somebody could come with sorcery, somebody could come with trickery, and they can lead you to believe that something else is right. And I'm telling you, don't believe that something else is right. You follow my commands. Yeshua tells us that many will come just like me, many antichrists, anti-Mashiachs, many will come. Don't follow them. They will tell you that I'm here or that I'm there. I'm not there. Don't follow them. I've shown you who I am and where I am. And I've told you how I'll return. And when I return, every eye will see it. Everyone will see it. Everyone will know. That's a different, that's a different conversation. For the Jewish people, the Mishnah says, the people of Israel did not believe in Moses because of the miracles he performed. Indeed, one who believes because of miracles retains a measure of doubt in his heart, since a miracle can be done by trickery or sorcery. Isn't that interesting? So if you believe someone because of a miracle, you still leave a little bit of doubt. But all miracles that Moses performed in the desert were by necessity, and this is the beautiful part. This is how you know God works in your life. That the miracles that happen to you in your life are by necessity. They're not just some random miracles that happen and then someone telling you, follow me. Look what I've done. I've turned this staff into a snake. Follow me. Well, what does that snake have to do with me, number one, that nakash? Why does that nakash have anything to do with me? And why does that staff have anything to do with me? It doesn't. I'm just showing you my power that you should follow me? Well, no, I'm not doing that. Here, we see that in the Mishnah, it tells us that every miracle was performed out of necessity, not to prove his prophecy. It was necessary to drown the Egyptians. We were right there, we saw it. That miracle was required for my salvation. So he split the sea, submerged them in it, they needed food, so he brought down manna that was right there, and I saw it. I needed it. It was out of my own necessity. God performed a miracle on my behalf. Therefore, I can't not believe. I had nothing. And so he brought down manna. They thirsted, so he split a rock. Korak and his company denied his authority, so the earth swallowed them up, and the same with all the miracles. Every miracle that occurs to the children of Israel was out of necessity or need. And God actually allowed them to go through that need so that he could actually glorify himself. Through your need, your necessity, your problem, God will be glorified through the miracles he performs in your life. Amen? And so it continues, 
Why did they believe in him? Because when we stood at Sinai, our own eyes saw it. Our own ears heard the fire, the sounds of the flames, and how Moses approached the cloud, and God's voice called to him. And we heard him say, Moshe, Moshe, tell them such and such, as it is written, face to face God spoke with you, panim al panim, and not with our ancestors did God make his covenant. The event at Sinai alone is proof that Moshe's prophecy is true. Without the shadow of a doubt, as it is written, Behold, I shall come to you in a thick cloud so that the people should hear me speak to you and also believe forever. From this we see that prior to that they did not believe in him with a faith that is everlasting. Only with a faith that leaves a possibility for doubts and second thoughts. The church itself doesn't believe in Moshe even to this day. But God says in Deuteronomy that I came to you in a thick cloud so that they would see this. And I spoke to you from the cloud so that they would hear it. So that what? They would believe on you, Moshe, forever and ever throughout all the generations. And the church doesn't believe in Moshe. How? Do you read the Bible? Are we reading? Are you reading the same thing I am? Pointing it out, facts, just pointing facts out, putting it on the table, elephant in the room, normal stuff. Like, okay, let's talk about this. Let's not evade it. Let's not shut down. Let's not avoid the conflict. Let's have the conflict. I mean, we need to talk about it. Why? To lead us to unity. But the conflict is in love. It's, in, it's, in, it's, it's, it's important to come together and speak so God can move. I want Yeshua to return, do you? I want the kingdom to come, do you? Well, that means that, that Israel has to say, Baruch haba Hashem Hashem, and that means that Christianity and Israel have to come together at some point in unity. So what's leading us there? We have to get there. The children of Israel believe because they experience God for themselves on the individual level and together as, as a corporate body. And they could relate to each other's experience through the words of God that gave Moses because, because they heard the words that God gave Moses. And so at this point, the covenant between God and Israel was not based on blind faith like it is now. Your faith now is based on blind faith. It's based on what someone else heard and saw. You didn't see it. You didn't hear it. That means blind faith. And the scriptures tell something very special for you who believe and have not seen. The scriptures say you're blessed. That's a very special thing. To believe and not see without, and not have doubt. And not hold doubt without having seen it. Have you ever heard of someone tell you a story and be like, look, I saw it with my own eyes? No, you didn't. Yeah, I did. It's true. I saw it. No, you didn't. We have those conversations. I feel like that happens to me all the time. I feel like I tell someone, they're like, you're just making stuff up. I'm not making it up. I saw it with my own eyes. No, you didn't. What, what do you mean? No, I didn't. You believe without having, without having seen it. That's a beautiful thing. The Torah is not just a set of rules, but a sacred path to holiness. We have to know that. It's intended to guide us as the compass towards spiritual redemption because it is Yeshua's compass. That spiritual redemption is found in Yeshua where the physical and the spiritual ultimately unite in this in the spiritual Gan Eden, which will soon become a physical Gan Eden because God takes the spiritual and makes it physical. He took the physical and made it spiritual. Literally, Gan Eden became a spiritual thing. It's no longer physical. Anyone been there? Anyone, anyone go there? Like there's the sword, you know, flaming swords there in front of the garden. Have you seen it? Like I've been to the ark excursion. There's got to be a Gan Eden one. No, no one's been there because what was is now in the spiritual. But yet he's bringing that back to the physical. That will be back here. That's what his kingdom is. It's Gan Eden. It's Olam Abba. It's the world to come. Ultimately, many question the Bible today because they believe that man wrote it. They believe Moshe was, was just Moshe's words, but we have been taught by the ones who were taught by the ones who have seen 
and believe in that in what the witness has told us and we understand that these commandments are found in the books of the Torah we've been taught by the ones that were taught by the ones that saw Re'e. and so we believe so the Lord placed before us a choice read on your own Chapter 11, 13 through, I assume you already did, it's the parasha through 28. But verse 27 through 28 says, A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commands of the Lord your God, by turn aside, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. And so the Lord has placed before us a choice, a blessing and a curse, specific to our own doings and the feeding of our own inclination of free will. We have free will. We have it. And he placed before us an inclination. I'm inclined to do this or I'm inclined to do that. He gave us free will to make choices. Everybody has a choice. And I don't think anyone would ever step on your choice. But he feeds us on our own inclination. And whether we will pursue his word or whether we will pursue our own lusts and desires depends greatly upon what we've allowed ourselves to become. What are you allowing yourself to become? Do you understand that you're part of the vine and that the Father's the vine dresser and that you want to become someone who bears much fruit? And the fruit that we have to bear is the the coming kingdom. That's the only purpose in life. There's no other purpose but to bring the kingdom of God. Literally no other purpose. That should be it. That's the end game. So let's do that. But some people think, well, it's far, far away. So why why even bother with it? It's far, far away. (laughs) We were talking, my mom and dad and I were talking a few weeks ago about it. And we were talking about the thousand years, and you know, there's a thousand years. And Mom's like, "Well, that's a long time." I'm like, "Yeah, I remember her saying that. That's a long. That is a long time. Before we even get to Olam Haba, there's a thousand years that has to happen. We're not even even in the start. Like we're not even in the start. The kingdom has to be established here first, and then all kinds of stuff have to happen. The resurrection of the dead." is at minimum, if the kingdom was established today, the resurrection of the dead is at minimum a thousand years away. That's a long time. But Baruch Hashem, for the people that are dead and sleep, they're not going to realize that they've been sleeping for a thousand years. They're going to wake up and go, whew, how long have I been out? Like a thousand years. And you'll be like, what? (laughs) But that's where we're at in the scheme of all of this. That's why the rapture is so appealing, because it happens instantaneously, and you're in heaven with God, instantaneously. There's not this long, there's not this long sleep. Right? A sage says, indeed, the principles of free choice, that man has been granted the absolute autonomy to choose between good and evil, lies at the heart of the Torah's most basic premise, that human life is purposeful, that our deeds are not predetermined by our nature or any universal law, but are the product of our independent volition, making us true partners with God in creation, whose choices and actions affect the continuing development of the world as envisioned by its creator. This says that we have the ability to choose whether to follow after our own nature or to reject our own nature, which is to sin. Our nature is to sin. We have the ability to create. That's what, create, that's what brings us together. That's the beauty and the, of the autonomy to make free will decisions. We have the ability to create. That's what God wanted in us, and that's a beautiful thing. But the process of rejecting our nature, uh, uh, rejecting to sin, is found in tshuva, turning aside from evil, embracing the goodness and the truth of our spirit. And the reality, though, is that we are so removed from the, from the experience of, of Har Sinai, perhaps we can allow sin to become acceptable because its consequences is not necessarily immediate. The consequence of sin is not immediate. 
It doesn't happen right away. The earth isn't just going to get swallow you up right away. Your, your, your consequences aren't immediate. And so you can think to yourself and say, well, okay, I'll be forgiven. I'm forgiven. And that's the idea of the church. Rather than focusing on, on, on goodness and truth and following God's will and walking in his commandments and keeping, keeping your life righteous and focusing your spirit right and, and getting directed toward and oriented toward a life of righteousness, you, you think to yourself, I'm a sinner. I'm going to sin. Rather than saying, I'm righteous, I have to be righteous. I'm a sinner. We sin. What are we going to do? Praise God, there's chen. Praise God, there's grace. Praise God, the ark of Noah. So that we can come into it. And that God, God forgives us. Praise God for that. Yes, Baruch Hashem for that. I agree. But man, how do we get to a place where we're not focused on that? Where we're constantly repentant. Where we're constantly seeking forgiveness. We've been forgiven once when we asked for it. Now walk in his commandments. What does he tell the woman who was accused of adultery? What does he tell her? He says, go and sin no more. So he says, you're forgiven. Go sin no more. He's telling her to stop thinking about it. Don't live that way. Go live righteously. Focus on living righteously. Focus on living for him. And if your focus is on him, you're not worried about sin. You're not worried about going to hell. You ask the little kids, you could go to hell. Well, I don't know because I stole some cookies yesterday. You know, like it becomes one of those things. Come on. Like we can't be like that anymore. We're grown ups, we're adults. We have to move into faith. We have to grow up in our faith, which means that we have to mature. And in maturing, we find God. And in finding God, we find peace. And in finding peace, we understand salvation that we are and that we're that we're his righteousness and that we our job is to share that righteousness to the world around us John 1 9 says if you confess our, your sins he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness but both the verse before and the following says this verse 8 if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Agreed. Verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. True. We have to recognize that. That's the start, right? Chuva, repentance. Come to repentance. So we have to recognize it, confess our sins, experience the path of truly penitent heart, and resulting in the sin never to returning. Yet if one sins again in the same manner, it makes repentance more difficult. If you continue to sin the same, the same way, then we've permitted our sin. And the repentance is impossible unless one learns to intensify the fear of God in your soul so that fear will keep oneself from the lure of the evil inclination. Fear keeps you from the lure of evil inclination, of doing that which is bad, fearing God. When you sin willingly and permissively, you have no fear of God. In Proverbs, Solomon says, As a dog returns to its own vomit, so is as a soul repeats its own folly. That means that although a dog might detest something, spewing them up makes them even more detestable. Yet the dog will eat them again. In like manner is the fool who does something reprehensible, but doing it again makes it even more reprehensible. In this parasha, we've learned that God will bless those who keep his commands and curse those who reject his statutes and choose to follow after the inclination for evil. I've correlated this concept to the vine dresser and the vine. When you're not bearing fruit, you're following the evil inclination. When you're bearing fruit, you're following the good inclination. Those that follow Yetzer Hara, that evil inclination, are broken off and thrown into a pile of brush and burned. We have free will to choose. That's the beauty of it. I can choose to become a dead stick that gets thrown into a pile. I make that choice, and I should understand that that choice is mine. It wasn't God's. God didn't make me do it. I chose, or I choose to have fruit and go and live my life connected to the vine, 
where only fruit can be born from that, right? We read that in John. So we understand that the laws that were given to Moshe were not the words of Moses, but rather the words from the voice and the breath of God as witnessed by our ancestors around the mountain. We, we also learned that in addition. First John verses 1 through 7 says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. Listen, listen to that again. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. What do we talk about? The miracles of God that had been performed, they saw them with their eyes, they heard them, they saw them, the voice of God. First John's telling you the same thing. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show you that eternal life, which was of the Father, was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. That's so important in the Jewish context. The, those statements. These aren't miracles that we're teaching you that were from sorcery or trickery. This is what we have seen and what we have heard. That's why it's talked about. It. That's why it's repeated here in 1 John. It's a Jewish idea, a concept that's founded all the way back in Davarim 11. It's important for you to understand that I saw it, I recognize it, and I bear witness to it. That's what we have seen and heard declare unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Yeshua Mashiach. And that these things write me unto you, that your joy may be full. We're sharing you this in unity. So that you might have peace and find joy. Be full of joy. Then this message, which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, Ruch Hashem, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not truth and do not the truth. But if we walk in light, as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we walk in the light, and he is in the light, if we abide in him, and he abides in us, if I am a vine connected to his branch, if I am bearing fruit, if you are bearing fruit, who are of the light must walk in the light, for in the presence of God we have to be wise to fear and depart from evil. Proverbs says that whoever confesses and forsakes sin will obtain mercy. And happy is the person that always fears. That's, hard. That's a hard comment, right? Happier is the person who always fears. But one that hardens one's heart will fall into evil. We who are the followers of Mashiach have to be called the penitent every day, exerting ourselves fully to proceed along the path of repentance, constantly intensifying the fear of God within our souls, which will bring more happiness to our lives and the joy of blessing. If we intensify the fear of God in our souls, we will be happier than we've ever been. Does that make sense? Does biblically. The more fear that you have of God, the happier you'll be, because you'll be in Him. I'm going to end with reading Col uh, Colossians 3. I love this, this chapter. I read it a few times this week. If then you have been raised with Mashiach, which I assume all of you have, Seek the things that are above, where Messiah is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things of the earth. This is telling you to choose good from evil. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Yeshua and God. You are hidden. This week I was on a call, a Zoom call with an international group. I don't know, eight countries represented on this call. And I was given my talk. And some lady gets on there and she says, Michael, who's Michael? Michael, where, where, where are you? My spoke so you can see my face because Zoom works that way. 
She goes, can I call you? I have to, I have to say it. He's like a Nozrim. And I'm thinking to myself, what? She goes, you're like one of the hidden ones. I hear what you're saying and, you know, the, what you're telling us. Your message is so important. You're, you're like one of those ones hidden that God has to reveal. And I, and I read this scripture this week. And I thought to myself, and I'm not touting myself up. I'm talking to all of us. That's what we are. That's what this scripture says. You must die to yourself. You must be buried. Your life has to be hidden in Mashiach. You can't be the person you are. You have to look back on yourself and say, that was me, it's no longer me, I, that guy died. Until you can say that person's dead and be reborn out of the hiddenness of Yeshua, you can't move in his kingdom. You won't. You won't bear fruit. When Messiah, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in his glory. You will appear with him because you're connected to him. You're not yourself. Put to death, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Anyone that says they don't worship idols, they're not idol worshipers, you are if you're covetous. You're an idol worshiper. That's what the Bible tells us. Verse 6 is important. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. The wrath of God is coming. That kingdom which we talked about, that is coming, is coming to destroy this stuff. If it lives in you, you'll get caught in the brush fire. Kill it. Die to yourself. Die to these things. Because this is why God's destroying this earth. This is why his wrath is coming. It says it right here. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked. Be reborn. When you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie one to another. How many of you lie? Everyone lies. But like outright lying is irritating. Right? When you know someone's just outright lying. Seeing that you have put off your old self with its practices. That means get rid of all these things. Guess what? Guess what happens when you get rid of? We started this conversation with it. The gossiping, the backbiting, the infighting, the vipers, the brood of vipers that go after each other, the stuff that goes on. That creates what? Anger. It creates wrath. It creates malice, slander, slandering each other in, within the, even within your own communities. Across churches, between churches, Eton Bar is doing that now. All that stuff. Once this stuff goes away and you die to it, what can you do? Become unified. You can find unity. Verse 10, have put on the new self. Put on the new self. Put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator, Yeshua HaMashiach, God the Father. Here there is no Greek there is no Jew, there is no circumcised, there is, there is no uncircumcised, there is no barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Yeshua is all and in all. The, we are unified. Unified. Unity of the brother. That's where we're headed. That's where we have to go. And you have to be a part of that. In order to bear fruit, guess what? Everything you say that comes out of your mouth should be toward that unity. 
should be toward that kingdom because without unity, how can people say, Baruch Abba Hashem Hashem? Amen. It is our duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe greatness to the author of creation, for he made us unlike the nations of the lands, and has not placed us like the families of the earth. He has not made our portion like theirs and our lot like all their multitudes. We bend the knee and bow, acknowledge our thanks before the king over kings, the holy one blessed is he. He stretches out heaven, establishes the foundations of earth, and the seat of his glory is in the heavens above in the presence of his God, in the presence of his powers in the most exalted heights. He's our God, there's none other. True is our king, there's nothing beside him. As it is written in his Torah, you shall know this day and take to your heart that the Lord, he is God in the heavens above, and on the earth below, there is none other.